But if we're all in the mystical tradition and really in touch with ourselves as, you know, having our own spiritual path, our own independent investigation of spiritual truth, then it's very difficult to manipulate people, you know, not just that oneness, but also that that finding the divine power within yourself, uh, I think is so important. And it's so important to healing too, uh, you know, knowing that you have the power. Um, yes, you know, we're given physical means to bring that about. But the first decision is that spiritual decision that you want to heal and that you are going to be an advocate for yourself. Welcome, beautiful beings, to season two of the Cosmic Love Antenna podcast with your host, Harrison Ma. This podcast sets the loving intention of creating the mystical space needed to pull back the layers restricting health, alignment, and love. Now let's walk you home to your cosmic spiritual heart space. Before we continue this beautiful chat today, wonderful souls, I need to jump in here to share something really exciting. If you've been following these episodes or you've been following me on social media, you know that I am in the process of releasing my first book, Your Cosmic Love Antenna, Define, Embody, and Emit Your Unique Frequency of Love. And at the time of this episode release, pre-orders are now open. If you have been pulled to this show, if you're looking to understand the what, the how, and the why of love, if you're looking to apply some of the tools connected to your chakras in a child, releasing religious trauma, ancestral healing, emotional release, and so much more, then this beautiful expression from my heart to yours is for you. If you are looking to channel more of your unique gifts and the divine frequency that you are, these pages will open all of this up. And if you're interested, all you need to do is go to cosmicloveantenna.com. That's cosmicloveantenna.com. And you can pre-order this book right now. If you pre-order, click on that link, put in your email, you're going to get access to some special gifts that I'm only offering to those who get in before I release it fully. These gifts are going to be some more channeled meditations, activations, and some other surprises from my heart to yours. So head over to cosmicloveantenna.com, pre-order this beautiful expression, and I can't wait to hear how it shifts your life. If you're listening to this after pre-order sales, that same link can be also used to go to the direct purchase link. Sending love, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode today. Good morning, evening, afternoon, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the show. Another deep dive into a loving chat with spiritual heart. Before I get the divine honor, and I'm really excited to talk to my friend today, but before I get the divine honor to chat with her and, and go into all the beautiful elements of our discussion today, a quick reminder for all of the wonderful souls, both returning and new to this show. If you get a, a bit of value out of this chat today, if it hits your heart, please remember to share this out far and wide with someone that you feel it can impact and change. If you get some insights that help you see something differently, remember you can always leave your feedback and your perspectives on Apple and Spotify in your reviews. And make sure you listen to this episode to the end because I already can tell that the beautiful Dr. Emmy is going to share some gems that you're going to want to soak all up. Speaking of Dr. Emmy, she is my beautiful guest today. Dr. Emmy is a holistic board certified medical doctor. She is a dear friend and a soul on a mission to help others lose weight, help with their body composition, and bring them back to the healthier versions of themselves. We're going to have a chat today about what individualized and holistic medicine is and why it's so important. Where does Emmy's heart come into this? The powerful overlooked weight loss and health tips that Dr. Emmy has on her heart the expansion of Emmy's light in this world, and so much more. Dr. Emmy, my friend, welcome back to the Cosmic Love Antenna. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here with you, Harrison. I was uh, reflecting, I think, yesterday or the day before. It's been almost a, almost a year, my friend, since 
we had our last chat on this show and I know a lot's changed for me in that year, but I'm kind of interested and I guess maybe we can start here. What What's changed in your world, Dr. Emmy, since a year ago, since our last chat? Well, I think, you know, I, I've been able to reach more people um, mm-hmm. and that's been really great. So, you know, I think um, a lot of people, especially women in the middle years, feel very unheard in the medical system. They'll go in with symptoms and they're just told it's normal and they have to live with it. And, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. There's so much you can do for a lot of what happens. And so I think that message that you can do something and that there are things that you can do based on your individual needs and goals and genetics and where you are hormonally, I think that message is resonating. And so I've been able to really reach a lot of people and, and share a lot of information about that. Yeah. So that's great. And I, I'm so excited for you, my friend. I, I want to speak more about this in a bit, but a question bubbles up in regards to that sort of shift that you've noticed of, of awareness around individual health. What, in your opinion, because it feels like it's a collective thing. I've seen it to a degree in my work. What do you think, right. if you had to hypothesize, what do you think is the reason for this collective shift, this this d- deeper sort of need to go into this direction? Well, I think part of it is success stories. Um, the fact that people can really get so much out of learning more about themselves and their personal bodies. And, you know, I always, even before we had nutrigenomics and all these modern tools that we have now to really get down to the individual and who they are, even when I was in training, I noticed that who I thought were the best healers, the best physicians were people who really had a lot of respect for our individuality and really like took people's, um, you know, differences seriously. They did not um, always, you know, expect like a certain outcome for something. They understood that people can individually respond differently to things. And this was even in, you know, I trained in like ICU settings and really, you know, like the hospital when I was training, but I noticed that even then. And in outpatient medicine, it's so much more that because we are, you know, following someone over time, uh, in health coaching, which you and I both do, you know, I, I work as a physician, but I also work as a health coach. Um, you know, we really get to know people, not just from their uh, maybe medical issues or their struggles, but like how they're implementing these things into their lives and what all the different things in their lives are that are impacting them, be it, you know, like you work with past trauma or, you know, what I'm looking at is, you know, what what can I do in their lifestyle today to make a difference in their health long term? And so um, I think, you know, It's always sort of been there in the best, but I think as people have um, had better expectations of what's going to happen, (laughs) um, that's gotten, you know, a little more, um, a little more accepted. And I think, you know, in some ways more so than in the past, um, there's been an attempt to regulate things and make things more of a cookbook when it comes to medical care, like these are quote, your standards of care and you must treat everyone who has this disease this way, you know, regardless of their individual goals or all the other factors that you're looking at. Um, You know, everyone has to get this one treatment. Um, And I think, you know, more so than when I trained in the eighties and nineties, that's become kind of a, a shift in the regular medical world. Whereas I think people are, you know, kind of, going against that now and saying, well, I'm an individual and my needs are different and and there's different things about me. I think so all of that was beautiful, my friend, but I, 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 my heart resonates mostly with that last piece that you just said. I think what I, how I see this is within the spiritual community, there's this term coming around of the sort of great awakening and the great sort of waking up in many ways. And I think part of that great awakening isn't just a spiritual awakening it's a it's a physiological one too it's a coming back to that innate power that's inside of them across their physical well-being and and because and i think you nailed it perfectly i think because there has been so much push to regulate and push to push people into a certain box that they must fit their their being and their essence in many ways is pushing back to that and that's where 
people like you, going back to what we first just started talking about, you're standing so strong in your beautiful light at the moment and offering your services in the way that you know how based off your story and journey. And now it's these two forces are coming together, right? These two waves of beautiful light workers standing in their truth and the masses awakening to more of what they need. Yes, very much so, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I mean, the other thing is that people relate really differently to different healers. I mean, there's people for whom I'm not the best healer. I'm not the person that's in tune with them. Um, but you know, for the vast majority of women in the middle age, I'm probably the right healer. I understand what they've gone through and, and, um, you know, I, I I have been there, you know, and I, and I've, had doctors tell me, well, there's no way you're only eating 800 or 1200 calories a day and you're still 235 pounds. So, so let's, let's talk about walking the walk, Dr. Emmy, you, you don't just treat people individually and personalized by, by providing services within that sort of category. You are also a holistic MD. And I would encourage people they're listening to this episode, I'm going to put our first chat that I had with Dr. Emmy a year ago in the show notes. So you can go back and listen to it because we talked a bit about this, but I sort of want to refresh people's minds and refresh people's hearts. When you say you are a holistic doctor and you treat people holistically, what does that mean to you? So, you know, it's a mind, body, spirit model, really, of looking at a person. So it's not just their body, but it's also looking at where they are mentally in their healing journey, where are they spiritually in their healing journey, most importantly. Um, so that's one big part of being a holistic doctor. The other is really looking back. Um, you know, for instance, when I do a functional medicine exam on someone, they fill out a form that tells me, you know, what kind of dental work they've had. Mm. Were they breastfed or bottle fed? How are they born? Were they like a vaginal <laughs> or C-section? Because all of these things really affect us, not only from uh, like a physical standpoint, you know, like if you're breastfed, your microbiome is going to be different than if you're bottle fed. But from a spiritual standpoint, because, you know, that has to do with your bonding with your initial caregiver, you know, were, were they able to, um, you know, did they have struggles maybe uh, that impacted you? So that's kind of what the holistic model and, and the functional medicine model is about. Because when we work with people on a functional medicine uh, framework, we actually do a timeline of the things that they tell us happened to them and look back at where their healing journey might have gotten off track. So it's not just checking really thorough labs and really, you know, delving into the person like genetically and biochemically and all that, but it's also looking at their journey from a, from a lens of what happened to get us here. Yeah. It's so, it's so comprehensive and uh, it just, it, it's funny as you're explaining this, Dr. Emmy, it's making me miss our clubhouse chats on, on, on clubhouse talking about this sort of topic of holistic healthcare, right? And, and it's, it's so important to really tick off all these boxes and understand someone's history within this mind, body, spirit lens. I'm, I'm interested my friend just personally, cause I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what comes up for you when I ask this question. I've noticed in my in my work that I do, I've I've niched down to a degree, if you can call it a niche, to a lot of that sort of those spiritual emotional components. And because of that, because that's what's resonating with my heart mostly at this point in time in my journey, I I tend to attract clients and people and souls that have those specific challenges, right? They may have other gut challenges and they need to move their body and get in the sun, all those things. But they, the thing that they're challenged with most are those components. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. Dr. Emmy, in your practice, because you are so comprehensive and doing all these things, do you see any specific trends based off sort of maybe what you're so passionate about right now? I mean, absolutely. Because, you know, one of the things that a lot of people face especially a lot of the women I see is that they are caregivers and many times they are not putting themselves first. That's kind of the root of their health issues. And that's kind of where that whole, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first comes from, because I think, you know, a lot of people in middle age, um, they're still dealing with their children or whatever had happened there, their partners, um, 
or, you know, the lack thereof many times nowadays. And then also elderly parents that they're taking care of, and then they have a job. And so all of those stressors really are what's sort of dictating what happens to them. And the time for themselves is really limited. So one of the things I teach people to do is really carve out that time for themselves and maybe, you know, try to get help for things that, um, you know, are burdening them at this point, you know, sharing the burden a little bit as much as they can. And sometimes that's really hard, you know, like someone's an only child and they don't have siblings to help them, that sort of thing. But um, trying to get people to really understand that putting their own health, both mentally and spiritually and physically, is going to help them be a better caregiver, I think is one of the main things that I try to do. Oh, yeah, it's so big. It's so it's huge. And I'm so happy that mm -hmm. you're honing on that, my friend. I have a question around this, but just to reiterate what you're saying, another way to describe it would be, you know, this self-love is selfless, right? Because when you fill up that beautiful cup that you are, that beautiful channel of love and light that you are, then you then impact the world in a different way, right? You, you can't impact the world if your if your light is dim, right? It, you can, but it's going to be, it's going to be, walking uphill, right? There's going to be a lot of pressure and extra stress that you don't need to take on. What, will be. what are your theories, my friend? Because I have mine and maybe I'll share some here, but I want to hear yours first. What are some of your theories around where this comes from, this sort of self-sacrifice, this self-love is selfish, this, you know, I can't put myself first because that means I don't love people. Where do you think this comes from? I think it's kind of ingrained in our culture, you know, that people are, quote, selfish if they take care of themselves. Um, and uh, I'm not exactly sure where it came from. I think for us Americans, probably from the Puritan tradition <laughs> um, of looking at things in kind of this warped way. Um, but I don't know about around the world, uh, you know, um, where it comes from elsewhere but i think for us that's one of those things it's like you know if you're so you know if you're taking care of yourself you're, you're self-absorbed and that's not really true it's basically you know you want to be able to function optimally so that you can be all that you can be you know to everyone because what a lot of people don't know is things like your gut health are going to affect your mood and whether yeah. you're likely to snap at somebody or not you know that kind of thing yeah. So that's where the holistic umbrella of looking at things is really so different than, you know, just looking at symptoms. Yeah. I think if I would offer any advice on top of what you're saying is no matter what country you live in, no matter what culture you're a part of, no matter if you follow a certain religious ideology, really adding in mindfulness, and this is really what I want to get at next year, my friend, adding in mindfulness to those beliefs and those stories. So the example here being that story of self-sacrifice, others before oneself. You know, if, you, if you've worked on it in yourself, beautiful, but also being mindful of where it's coming in from. So if you're walking into it, your family or your friends or your religious group or your cultural group, and it now keeps projecting onto you, then mindfulness is the key to really help you make some choices that stop it from coming in. Right. What do you agree with this, my friend? I do. And, you know, mindfulness is so important when it comes to body composition. A lot of people don't know that. But like for me personally, one of my huge challenges was being a non mindful eater. And it came from my medical training. I mean, you know, it was just like wolf down the food as fast as you can before your beeper goes off and you have to run off. And so that was my conditioning, you know, and um, it took a lot to say, I'm going to sit down with this food and I am going to look at it. I'm going to smell it. I'm going to taste it before I chew it. Then I'm going to taste it when I chew it. Then I'm going to, you know, feel what it feels like to swallow it. And, you know, it's made me into like an ultra foodie because I really enjoy food now instead of like wolfing down, you know, food as fast as I can so that I don't get called before, uh, before that. Um, so I think, you know, Mindfulness is so important in so many ways, uh, you know, being mindful of how we treat other people uh, has so much to do with like what happens in our relationships. Um, 
you know, that consideration. So I think uh, all of that is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Again, I, I want to direct people back to our first chat when we talked about your, I got the memory as you're explaining you, you eating the food with mindful, not mindfulness, that you, the experience you had in your, in your education, right. And you, and you living, I think you said you're living on campus and eating things and it's sort of your body changing and not in the way that you wanted it to eat, to, wanted it to be. Right. But just to consider this for people, when we are mindful, we're not just supporting our body composition in that act of mindfulness. We can also add love, love, mm-hmm. add love to what add love to the food, right? There's, yes. there's such a, I want to get your thoughts on this, Dr. Emmy, but there's such a, you know, the diet wars and the, 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 the whatever diet group you're in is so prolific in the world right now. And, I think the Mm -hmm. thing that's not being spoken about within all of them is our loving relationship with whatever food we're eating, right? If it's animal food, if it's plant-based, not many people are speaking about the power of adding loving intention to whatever the thing is we're putting in our mouth. What what are your thoughts on this? I think that's so true. Um, You know, and I think uh, whatever you know, life force is giving us that food. It's really important to acknowledge that. And it's easier to acknowledge that when you're eating whole foods because you're closer to what that food once was. Um, But yeah, I think that's so important. And I think, you know, it will make people enjoy food more. Um, And I think it's so important that you brought up the food wars because, you know, genetically we're all programmed to eat differently. And uh, some of us will do very, very well with the plant-based diet and others will not. Um, And so, I think that dogma around, you know, how everyone should eat is kind of wrong because everyone um, has different needs and like different ancestral patterns of eating that have been suited to them through thousands of years. Uh, Many of us are mixed now, so we have to kind of figure out what that pattern was. Um, But um, for certain people, certain ways of eating are so much more suited to them. Um, And I think, you know, that connection with the ancestors is so important uh, the love and intention, like you were talking about, looking at what you're eating and the sacrifice of that plant and animal and nourishing you, um, you know, is is really important. And that will, I think, make people really value what they eat yeah. and also enjoy it more, you know, because um, wolfing down food, I didn't really ever really enjoy it. It, it wasn't <laughs> like, this is my favorite thing because nothing was my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. And that, so, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't surprise me that there's no enjoyment there, even with the whole foods, because right. you know, this is just this is just my perspective. But at the end of the day, when you break all of it down, what is it? What is the food? What are we? We are energy. Right. And when you add your loving intention to that energy, you're transforming it into something else. What are you transforming it into? You're transforming it into love. So it it's we're making it very simplistic but it almost can be in many ways when you when the loving intention is not there it doesn't feel good when loving intention is there it does feel good in many ways right Let, absolutely i want to throw an example out at you my friend because i actually heard you speaking about this on uh, one of your platforms recently to all of your followers and maybe this will get super specific to make this even more clear here you i want to hear your thoughts on the carnivore diet. The carnivore diet is <laughs> is a is a perfect example of what we're talking about here, right? One of these sort of groups of 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 ways of eating that almost has, you know, a religious dogma around it. So I've, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm interested. What are your views on it within this topic we're talking about now? I mean, I think it works for certain people better than traditional diets because certain people are very. Uh, prone to get inflammation from grains. And so they think that, oh, you know, I went on this carnivore diet, I eliminated everything except for meat, and I'm doing better. But really, they probably don't need to be as restricted, most of them, I think. Um, You know, we never had ancestors that were strictly carnivores that I can think of in any, um, you know, any culture that I can really think of. Um, so to me, it's a little odd because, you know, uh, your colon needs fiber and, um, you know, uh, it's hard to like live without 
a lot of the antioxidants you can get from plants. Um, and the people I've seen on the diet have not done well. Like I've had patients who've tried it and, you know, have had either immune complications that were very crazy or they've had, uh, you know, uh, their numbers for inflammation and cholesterol really look scary. And I don't have the same dogma about cholesterol as most docs do. Like, I, you know, I'm not um, attached to like that model of cholesterol, but but I am looking at, you know, whether it's increasing like your um, oxidized bad cholesterol, is it increasing your markers of inflammation? And in the patients that I have personally followed, and there's no long-term studies on this particular diet, so I can't say like this study shows it's really great, um, but it goes against my experience. I just have my experience. And my experience is that the numbers look odd. And, and I've had people have some complications who have tried it uh, because they wanted to. Now they did look lean, um, I think, because they aren't really getting grains or carbohydrates. And some people really respond to that. Others don't. Others do better on a plant-based diet as far as being lean. So it's, you know, it's really different based on our body types, our genetics, uh, which diets are going to do well for us. Um, but personally, you know, I haven't seen, um, despite the testimonials uh, for the Cardin Moore diet studies or personal experience, it would make me think it's it's a great way to go for most people. But I'm sure there are exceptions. I mean, there's probably a diet that works for every person. Yeah, and I, I think so. I think I'm so aligned with your view on this, Dr. Emmy. And I think mm -hmm. a, a big part of it, and this is this is not carnivore exclusive. This is within all of the groups, which is why I wanted you to give a specific example. Mm -hmm. There is, we go, went back to the sort of holistic model of healing before. And this yes. is, this is my feeling and I'll, I'll get your thoughts on this within, within these diet groups. Let's say that I I've, I've, I've leaned into a particular way of eating. Let's use carnivore as an example. And it has helped me for some time. Then what tends to happen, because most likely if that person has challenges with their physical health, they most likely will have challenges maybe with their emotional health. Let's use that as a specific category. What tends to happen, and this is what I want to get your views on, we, we then acknowledge that we are in a tribe. We're in a, we're in a, we have this sudden sense of security and safety and support and we've healed ourselves maybe to a degree with the particular diet but now what starts to supersede that physical healing is the external emotional healing that we're getting from the support and the tribe and the you know i want to say superficial safety of the group so that so i want to this is what i want to get your views on that now can maybe i want to say blind us from maybe what our body is telling us, maybe what our body is saying, oh, maybe now is not the time. I no longer need to be on this, you know, this carnivore diet. Now I need to change. What are your thoughts on this, Dr. Amy? I mean, I think that's true. Um, and if you do manage to build a tribe around way of eating, I think that does, you know, kind of uh, help people stay on that particular way of eating, um, whether sometimes it's good for them or not. Um, I think that's very true. I think, you know, having that sense of belonging, that sense of um, purpose with your diet is really, really important. Um, and I think, yeah, that is probably one of the mystiques around that particular diet. Um, and I, and the other diets I talked about had their own tribes too. Weight Watchers had its tribe, uh, uh, you know, and um, people will, will kind of come after you and go, well, that's not how they're telling me to eat. Yes, this is the food they're selling, but that's not how they tell you to eat. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was very, very interesting because, um, it just seems like, you know, if you name something and brand it and then have people belong to the group, they kind of get very wrapped up in, um, that diet versus, you know, what's going on with them at this moment. That's true. So I guess then let me ask you, Dr. Emmy, as the medical practitioner and specifically the holistic practitioner, what advice would mm -hmm. you give to someone that is stuck in that, that, you know, that tribalism and not, and, and now because of that, it is detrimental to their health. What advice would you give? So, you know, the take survey of your health and if something is not working for you change, <laughs> you know, um, 
I had to do that because initially the diet that worked for me was low glycemic, but going through menopause, that just was not enough. I had to go like all the way to an anti-inflammatory diet to lose weight. And, um, you know, I had to add certain things more and take certain things away uh, because my body needed different things at that point. And it wasn't going to just lose, uh, you know, get lean on a, on a um, typical low glycemic diet um, anymore. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's super important to take stock of that, um, and to really check in with yourself, uh, to see, you know, am I still at the benefits that this particular way of doing things got me before. Mm. Coming back to that inner guidance, coming back to that, that inner voice that I think for most of us, and I, I know you can relate to this, Dr. Emmy, it, it's probably screaming right? It's our inner voice is probably screaming to be heard. And it's just, yes. it's, it's overshadowed by all the other voices outside of us that we feel need our attention most, right? But uh, ideally, ideally, we need to look within. So let's continue this thread, Dr. Emmy. And we've spoken about this in regards to mindfulness. I'm wondering, what are some other powerful, maybe overlooked practices, tools, uh, ways of healing that that someone who's looking to lose weight, have better, better body, body composition, become more healthy holistically. What are some overlooked tools and practices that you see in your work that can help people? So I... I think, um, you know, mirroring genetics with what's going on with you from a lab perspective is something that I really like and I think is overlooked on a lot of programs. Genetics are very helpful because they kind of explain your findings, but they're not helpful on their own. They kind of, mm. you have to look at the interplay of genes and we don't know all of them. We only test for, you know, something around a hundred genes when we're looking at those, but all of those are being turned on and off by our lifestyle. And so it's really important to look at Where's our lifestyle? Where's like the snapshot of where we are now and where is where we could be potentially? But there's some pitfalls we can learn from genetics. Like for instance, if you have a certain genetic makeup, lifting a lot of weight is not going to be helpful for your body composition. You need to do more reps um, and be more aerobically oriented. And it turns out that each of us actually gravitates to the exercise that's wrong for us because it's easier. <laughs> So, um, you know, so unless you want to be a professional bodybuilder, you don't want to like lift heavy weights, um, you know, unless you really want to bulk up if you have a certain genetic, if you want to have a normal looking body composition. So it's very interesting because I think that's one of those things. But I think outside of that, the testing is really things you can do to rewire yourself. So the tapping video that you did, I actually still need to share that on TikTok because I, I love it. Um, I think that's a really amazing acupressure way, um, you know, using the ancient wisdom of acupuncture with married with modern science of rewiring the brain uh, to respond to, differently to stress and to handle stress in a loving way. And what I love about tapping is that your mantra is always, even though I'm facing this challenge, I still, hold, you know, wholly love and accept myself. And I think that's so important because I think in the face of challenges, a lot of people doubt themselves, uh, don't fully love and accept themselves. So the reason I love emotional freedom technique and tapping is not only because it has really amazing um, science behind it, showing that it lowers cortisol levels and lays down relaxation pathways in the brain when you look at functional MRI or PET CT scanning. But I love that technique when it comes to body composition and health, because it's based on A, the science of rewiring your brain through you know, uh, using the channels that you have available to you on, on your face and upper body, but also um, the love and acceptance mantra that it, it makes you uh, go through. Because I think people don't uh, many times like have a mantra about loving and accepting themselves. And so that's so, so important. I'm so happy. Um, let, let me jump in there, Dr. Emmy, because this is, let's hammer in on this and we can speak about more tools if you have them. That loving acceptance. I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on what you're saying here because in my work, right? Because I do a lot of energetic trauma and spiritual work. This is this is such a this is probably the theme that comes up most. And when it shows up in the body, 
in my experience, it's usually the last place it shows up. Like when we when we see it manifest in the physical form as a maybe overweight or uh, you know a, a chronic pain or disease, it's usually a manifestation of a deeper uh, internal disconnection mentally, emotionally, spiritually. But I think the crux of this, and this is what I'd love to get your views on, when we say we love ourselves and accept ourselves, in many ways what that's doing is it's allowing us to release judgment, release shame, release guilt. And these emotions, these states of being in many ways, they weigh heavy on us, right? They, they, they weigh heavy on us. And I say those words very intentionally because, and this is what I want to get your views on, Dr. Emmy, if I'm holding on to a lot of guilt and shame and judgment, let's use the example around my weight, that's going to manifest in the physical body. Where, do, you, do you agree with this, my friend? What are your views on this? Yeah, it will. And, you know, it will increase cortisol and kind of become the self-fulfilling yeah. prophe prophecy because then you'll become more insulin resistant. Then your metabolism will work, not work as well. And so it is super important to release that and to release the traumas that, you know, have gotten us to where we are. Um, and the reason I like the mantra of loving and accepting yourself is because your words become reality, yes. you know? Uh, and so I think, it's super important to program ourselves to have the right words about ourselves. Um, even if it's in the beginning, we don't believe it and we're just saying it. Yeah. So, so important. So it's our, yeah. again, I'll, I'll get spiritual with everyone. There is, in my opinion, from a Vedic perspective, there is no objective outside reality. There is just the reality that we project from our internal state of consciousness. So as Dr. Emmy is beautifully highlighting, if we're creating an internal state of consciousness that is one of acceptance and and bliss and balance and homeostasis, that's what we create. And then the side effect of that, the happy side effect of that is that we, now we start to lose weight, right? Right, exactly. Dr. Amy, you, you were going to lead into another, I felt like you were leading into another tip and uh, practice that people can start to implement to to lose weight. What else was on your heart? So Reiki is very powerful. It's a uh, healing modality that uses the energy. And I think there's just not enough research actually on the powerful impact of energy when it comes to healing. Um, and it's a very, very underused and inexpensive <laughs> way of healing. Um, and so, you know, you can do Reiki on yourself and you can actually trade with other people. Um, so that's, that's what makes it super affordable. And you, you can go to a Reiki master, of course, also if you need something extra, but, but it's such a powerful technique. And it's something that I do with my patients. Actually, I have a Reiki master a uh, couple of times a year that teaches us, um, you know, the, the Reiki technique. And I've used it um, in so many people and it's so instant, you know, and uh, so that's one of the other ways that I really, you know, kind of, um, want people to know about and explore um, because yes, there's some of these things that we have to solve cost money like testing, <laughs> but some of the things you can do are absolutely free. And they're actually some of the most powerful things yeah. that you can do. And so, and you, you mentioned Dr. Emmy that Reiki, the science hasn't caught up yet. And I, I want to sort of pull this out for a second because I see this in myself when I get, when I get stuck in my mental mind, I can hear a statement like that and it can deter me from something so powerful as what you're describing with Reiki. And I want to speak to that for a second and maybe hear your thoughts on this as someone who's in both of these worlds in this energetic, spiritual, but also a very powerful scientific based doctor. I think we need to balance the line between what is scientifically proven and validated with our modern science and what works for us, but doesn't necessarily have the science behind us. What, what advice would you give my friend with someone that is looking to walk this line that, you know, wants to follow the science, but also sees things in their reality that science has yet to prove. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I was definitely there uh, with my son who's on the autism spectrum. I think we talked about this the last time yeah. we talked. But, you know, at the time, there was not a lot of proof for anything and still there isn't. Uh, and, you know, I was faced with a child that was very impaired with not a lot of guidance from professionals in the field that should have, you know, helped me. Um, and so my attitude was, if it's not harmful, I'm going to try it. <laughs> and so, you know, we did hyperbaric oxygen uh, because I, I just researched it and made sure that it wasn't going to be harmful for him. We did uh, mind-body wellness techniques. We did nutritional changes, um, you know, all with the mind of looking at, you know, what's really going to help because in a, some ways it's trial and error. Uh, but I think, you know, there is some proof for energy and intention in medical practice. For instance, there is proof that people who are prayed for do a lot better, have better outcomes. And to me, that's an energetic, uh, you know, healing that you're putting on someone in the form of prayer. Um, it's not very different from Reiki where you're projecting this energy to heal someone. Um, and so I think, you know, the studies will come hopefully over, over time. It, it's hard to get funding for things that don't make money um, to be studied, but hopefully, you know, they'll be studied over time. But, you know, if, if it's something that's not harmful and you're in a place where, um, you know, the proven science isn't helping you, then, you know, my thought is go for it and yeah. see if it does help. And, <laughs> so. And, and so two things come up with this. One, I think, as we talked about before, I think a part of the great awakening that we're in, the shift that we're moving through, I think part of that shift is is science that will be done with a non-profit mindset. I think there is a lot more Absolutely. science. I think, yeah, I, I think it, we are, that's such a, it's so outdated now, this, uh, you know, whatever the big system at play is that's that's funding the science, that is the only way to do big science. And I think it that's, that's shifting. So I have a lot of hope for that. But going back to what you just said, this idea of intention and adding our sort of openness to things that are yet to be proved. I think we have to remember that yes, there are, there are professionals outside of us that have views and perspectives but like we mentioned uh -huh. earlier, we also have our own inner guidance inside of us. So in your example, right. when, when we are trying something new that doesn't have the science or doesn't have the backing and is still safe, in that situation, we can always ask our inner guidance, our inner intuition, our inner knowing, and see how that feels. What, uh -huh. what are your views on this, Dr. Emmy? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that that's true. And I think people have an instinct for... Uh, you know, if they listen to it for things that are going to help them. Um, and uh, I think that's why it's so important to listen to the person you're working with as a healer um, to really hear what they're saying. Um, even if sometimes you don't agree with, with what they're doing, you know, acknowledging the upside for them, maybe telling them what the downsides could be, but really acknowledging that they are on their own healing journey. And not everyone is really, you know, uh, like I said, there's people who are going to be helped with a different mindset or a different practitioner uh, than me. So I, I have to acknowledge that as a healer too. When I'm looking at someone as a healer, it's like, am I really the best suited person for that? Yeah. And yeah. that's, I think that's one of the reasons I love you so much, Dr. Emmy, is because you are, there's hardly any ego in what you do in the world, my friend. Yeah, I can, I can feel your loving heart in all that you do, which, mm -hmm. which takes me now into my next question. And uh, this is, this is more of all of these questions I'm personally interested in, but I would say this one is I'm most personally interested in as someone that observes you from afar that loves you very much. And is just, again, intrigued with maybe how you're moving through this. I know this will help people listening. So we talked about at the start of this chat, how your light has started to expand and it's your light and your your skills in the world is meeting this wave of interest. And because of this, your your popularity has increased. You, I'm going to plug you here. Yeah, uh, I think last week or the week before, you were on Good Morning America, and people were getting to see your light on the TV. Was it was it Good Morning America? Was it the right show? 
the Today Show. Today so show. the rival for Good Morning America. Today. That's Today Show. I'm in Australia, so I don't know them all too well. But yeah. it's the American TV show. American TV show. And yeah. so I guess my question here, Dr. Emmy, is how how have you personally been dealing with the rise of your of your attention and the not just the light that has been attracted to your light but the shadows the the people that maybe are trolling you or maybe trying to take your perspectives down a notch or say you're wrong how how have you dealt with this because i think this can probably help a lot of people listening it's been hard um you know and there are people who are just very uh, belligerent, I would say. Um, the best thing I can do for those people is just um, wish them well and 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 move them out of my life. <laughs> so that's kind of you know. And if I if I lose a follower, that's fine uh, because I don't want the negative energy in my space. Mm-hmm. Really, um, they're not at a place at this point that I can do anything but send them healing energy. And so that's what I do. I, I wish them the best. Uh, you know, send them healing energy and just hope that they, they can find their way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been very interesting because, you know, there are people who um, I think, you know, once you come to attention, just their negative way of thinking about things projects on whatever they encounter um, in the world. Um, and, you know, you can just hope for them that, uh, that they find that person that can, that they can relate to that maybe can change that shift for them. Uh, what I can do is just, you know, wish them well, wish them wellness and, you know, send them the the energy to heal so that they, um, you know, can, can live in a positive life. I think that last, that last piece of, of that whole process you just outlined of sending them love, sending them healing mm-hmm. energy, mm-hmm. I think is probably the hardest part for most people to do myself included because Mm -hmm. I think what we often don't see uh, and my impression is that you understand this is that that person that is judging you or hating on you or, or angry at you realistically 99% of the time they're in pain themselves, right? They're angry at themselves, right? The, I heard, I heard a quote last night, all, all, judgment is self-judgment right all external projection is just our i think it's mr carl jung says until we make the unconscious conscious it will run our lives and we will think it's fate so it, a lot of that is what's happening in these in these projections right it's our unconscious wounds that we see someone standing strong in their light in this example dr emmy and our shadows are brought to the surface, but we feel it is them. But in reality, it's our own pain that we need to move through. So just to summarize all that, by any sending love, it's helping them to a degree. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of, you know, at first it can be very wounding because you're not used to that. I mean, I'm used to having my patients that I've had for 20 years who know me where I've shown up to the hospital for them. And, and it's been a very different relationship. And now there are people who don't know you at all. And, and like you said, they're projecting whatever is going on. <laughs> so how do you, so it's how do you difficult. deal with that? Dr. Emmy, how, my, that's my next question. Cause I, I'm a highly sensitive person and I think you are a degree too, based off the, the time I've spent with you and, a lot of people listening to the show are highly sensitive or empaths or whatever, wherever you are on that scale. How do you deal with this in your busy schedule? How do you, because I know just as an example, it, it only takes one message where I'm not being mindful that can sort of just take me away sometimes, but I'm not conscious of that attachment. So how do you mm-hmm. practice when when things do get attached to you how do you find balance again to just come back to yourself? It's difficult. Um, and it's especially difficult as a holistic doc because you're already kind of out on 
in a lot of ways, you know, um, in, in American politics, we used to have John McCain, who was the maverick. He didn't really like, he was a name Republican, but he would vote differently and all that. And he had his own opinions about things. And that's kind of how you are in, as a, as a holistic doc, you have to kind of carve your own way because it's not like you're with the medical establishment either. And some holistic practitioners even have suspicions about you because you are an MD. So you're, you're very much out on your own. So it is difficult because you constantly have to bring yourself back to, this is who I am. This is my mission. And this is what I'm trying to do in the world. Um, And it's difficult sometimes, sometimes you do, you know, somebody does really jerk your chain and it, it can be difficult especially if they have things in common with you or, or know how to get to you really. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So that's, that's really, uh, it is a hard thing. I, um, I, I yeah. appreciate your honesty, Dr. Emmy in saying that. Mm-hmm. And because I think it's, it's easy for someone that doesn't know you to, to look at you, especially when you are on these big shows and, and, and reaching new heights, it's, it's easy for us as humans to think that I'm different to that person. I'm, I deal with my shit and Dr. Emmy, she just has it all together. She just, she's on it. She's perfect. She's in this image, but that's not what we just heard, right? Dr. Emmy is a human like we all are and finds it difficult as well. But, you know, that's not to say that all these beautiful techniques that you've shared with us today you're practicing yourself, right? You're doing on yourself, like you mentioned with the Reiki and the affirmations. So Mm -hmm. I guess let's talk about that. I mean, I need them as much as the next person. Yeah. (laughs) So so let me, let me ask you about that, Dr. Emmy, what in your life at the moment, what are you using most, right? What are you noticing is helping most, whether it's Reiki, your mindfulness, your nutrition, what, what's been helping most for you at the moment? I mean, it's really all of it, but also part of it is scaling back my schedule. Um, you know, I tend to be a person that likes to go, 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 uh, can never stop. And so taking some time to like not do things <laughs> is something that uh, has been really helpful uh, to have some of that inner perspective time and to have time to think um, is super important. Um, I think still for me, uh, tapping our emotional freedom technique is super big. Um, a patient actually initially taught this to me. Um, I wasn't aware of it until about three or four years ago, and it was life like life changing for me um, and a big part of my healing journey. So I, I lean on that quite a lot. Um, and then you know, uh, prayer and meditation. I was re- you know raised in a religious tradition uh, that's very open, uh, and very, um, accepting of diverse points of view, uh, but really has a very big mystical and spiritual core. So I go back to that quite a lot. Mm. I'm happy that that found its way into this conversation, my friend, because mm-hmm. that's one of our many, um, similarities and connections that we have is our love of the Rumi and the and Rumi and the sort of Sufi, mystical foundations of of islam in many ways and it's i really encourage people listening to hear dr emmy's words and to find that spiritual connection for yourself right because it's Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be in a religious ideology it could be if that's correct for you but having that connection connection to something bigger than the ego identity that we often get stuck in and we've spoken about many examples of what that is today can can be and i want to get your thoughts on this dr emmy can almost be like a just a surrender right a a letting go of all the things that the the ego deals with throughout the day and we just we let go to be held held by you know that that powerful essence that is inside of us does that relate it absolutely does. And, you know, one thing about Rumi was he was kind of, I would say, beyond just the Islam. So he brought in a lot of that Eastern mysticism into uh, what he did. And, and in my faith, the Baha'i faith, it actually is a marriage of all of this uh, also. So Rumi was kind of the stepping stone between these two ways of thinking. But, uh, but you know, you, you talk about like the Vedas and, and that tradition 
um, Rumi sort of intuitively infused that into Islamic mysticism and, uh, you know, brought this whole new thing in the world. But one of the emphases of Rumi's um, poetry, which, which also resonates in my faith tradition, is kind of that discovery of the self, um, you know, that, that the divine exists in each one of us. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in uh, the Baha'i faith, there's this uh, saying, turn th thy sight into thyself and behold me standing within thee, mighty, powerful. And so um, that's kind of what I get from Rumi's poetry also is that A, that we're one, you know, that oneness that we all share as a consciousness, uh, you know, as a as human beings that we're not aware of many times in our planet because uh, we're you know, at this point in our history into conflict and nationalism and just these crazy things that don't matter. Uh, but, um, you know, not just that oneness, but also that that finding the divine power within yourself, uh, I think is so important. And it's so important to healing too. Uh, you know, knowing that you have the power. Um, yes, you know, we're given physical means to bring that about. But the first decision is that spiritual decision that you want to heal and that you are going to be an advocate for yourself. Oh, goosebumps, Dr. Emmy. So I'm I'm happy that we have opened this little 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 rabbit hole here because it it uh, it ties back to something we spoke about earlier in this conversation. But before I get to that, I just want to honor you. I didn't realize that Rumi actively incorporated the Vedic perspectives into the into the Sufi, into his, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that he consciously did that, but he channeled yeah. that, you know, he channeled that idea of, of Eastern mysticism into Islam and kind of, you know, in, this, in the Sufi tradition, religion is kind of a shell. There's a mystical uh, aspect that kind of transcends religion, um, which I think also exists in the Vedic tradition. And it's really an old way of thinking about things, but, you know, it gets muddled in the way that people get dogmatic about religion and, and um, just certain, you know, ways of thinking in religion. But honestly, like at the core of every religion is this mysticism, this connection to the divine and to each other um, that I think is so important. Um, you know, what's, what's different about the way I was raised was that that was clearly stated. You know, so it was like mysticism is the root of religion and, you know, uh, everything else is kind of window dressing sort of. Um, but, uh, and that's, you know, in I think all, that's, that's in all religions, Dr. Emmy. Yeah, it is the, the core of all religions. It's just that in, in most of the older religions, uh, you know, some of the priestly traditions and the fact that religion becomes a place where people have money and power, yes. then kind of changes that message because there's no, money and power and mysticism and oneness so yeah it's kind of a, so yeah. this, so this goes back okay i want i want to speak to this but just quickly because you're, you're bringing up so much here you can you can actually find much like rumi in the in the bigger islamic faith you can find mystics within all of the religions to 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 help you anchor in this mystical foundation right i think kabir Kabir within the, I think he was in the Hindu tradition. I think Meister Meister Eckhart within the Christianity religion. There's there's these individuals that you can use as the gateway and notice this thread between all of them. But let's go back, Dr. Emmy, to this <laughs> this almost forced projection of the forgetting of the divine within us, and and you you you. You mentioned it briefly, but I want to expand on it a little bit more here so people heard it. You said this is a sort of a root to a lot of the health challenges we have. And I want to tie this back to the topic we spoke about this start this conversation, the self-sacrifice, right? The putting the world outside of us before our own needs. And I this came up as you were talking about it before, and I didn't want to mention it, but now it's time to mention it. I would actually say this is one of the cultural projections that is the root of that issue is that and there's no judgment here but many of us have either in this lifetime or previous lifetimes existed in religious groups that as dr emmy highlighted were projecting this dogma of separation of of separate from i i'm not god god is outside of me 
and I need to sacrifice myself to that external God because then I can't find my salvation. What I know this is a big topic, my friend, but what what, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really true. Um, and it c- kind of goes back to that tribalism that you were talking about, like diets, you know, like we're this religion and you're not kind of thing. And and of course, uh, then you can use religion as a powerful tool to shape people and their behavior, maybe for you know certain purposes. Uh, but if we're all in the mystical tradition and really in touch with ourselves as you know, having our own spiritual path, our own independent investigation of spiritual truth, then it's very difficult to manipulate people. Um, you know, and I think like Iran, where it is now, you know, Rumi's poetry was in Persian. It's kind of like the polar opposite of, you know, what Rumi was talking about. So it just shows you like within the same tradition, the same people in the same language, you can have something go so much into what we're talking about, where it's like institutionalized and and being enforced on people versus like the mystical way of looking at it, where it's all this individual journey towards the divine. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, my friend. I could talk to you about this all day. And it's just, it, it again, emphasizes the need to check in with your inner guidance, right? No matter the tribe, no matter the diet, no matter the religion, no matter the culture, (laughs) just check in, check in. What is that saying? Is it, is it saying, is it aligned with what's happening or is that inner guidance saying, "Mm, there's something, something off here. There's some fear consciousness here that's separating me. Dr. Amy, I want to I want to be mindful of your beautiful time here, and I've really enjoyed this chat today, as I expected. But I just I am grateful that I know you in this world, my friend, and I'm grateful that our souls have come back into each other's world. I, if anyone has resonated with your work, resonated with your voice and your heart today, and they want to get in touch with you, they want to find out more. I know you have some supplements. I know you have your coaching. Where can you direct people? so they can get some more Emmy goodness. So absolutely the best way, Harrison. And I want to thank you very much for having me because being with you is always a healing journey and always brings new perspectives. And the questions that you ask me really puts a lot of things together for me uh, that maybe have been disparate in my mind. So (laughs) I just want to thank you so much for having me. So the very best way to reach me is actually to DM me on Instagram. Um, That's really where I can actually have a conversation with people, uh, which I like to do. I I, I don't want to propose like one solution to everyone because there is no one solution for everyone. And so, um, you know, I just need to know. um, And at this point, I'm only helping people health coaching wise in the United States and can only, you know, have my supplements in the United States, unfortunately. Um, Hopefully that will change in time, you know, once we kind of get our sea legs here in the U.S., um, but, you know, I'm happy to give people resources, uh, you know, if I can, uh, but yeah, the Instagram DMs are the best way. Beautiful. So, uh, and that's at Dr. Spelled out dot Emmy. And as yeah. always from new people listening to the show, I'll put all of Emmy's details, her social in the show notes. So you can just click the details of the player and you'll see, you can go straight to her Instagram and just cause you're so prolific, my friend. I'd also recommend checking out Dr. Emmy's TikTok because her TikTok, you know, if you're on that platform, she's quite a presence on there too. So definitely check her out. Um, yeah, I would say Instagram is more technical information and TikTok is more our lifestyle information. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Emmy, I have one last question. I, I wasn't going to ask you, but I feel like I want to now because we just spent that last 10 minutes in that, in that spiritual space. I, well, in our first chat, I'm actually going to ask you the same question again because I want to see if it's evolved and changed. In our first chat, I asked you, as I do with everyone here on the show, what is your definition of love? How do you define love? And I'm interested, my friend, what is that definition for you now? Has it shifted at all? You know, I think love is that, you know, Universal oneness is one thing that love is, Uh, the realization that all that is around us is, you know, part of us. Um, And I think, you know, um, positivity is love, Um, always being mindful of putting that out into the world. 
uh, and to ourselves is is love. So I think those would be the two things that I really look at as love, both on a personal level and a more universal level. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Emmy, this is not a it's not a plot twist here, and this is not going to be new to people listening. But you embody that beautifully, my friend, in all the ways that you show up. And I think that's I think that's why we were pulled to each other very initially, right? It's because you 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 emit that essence. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you for being in this world. Thank you for your time today, for all the beautiful listeners out there. Thank you for your attention, your heart, your appreciation. If this hits your heart today, please share it far and wide. But regardless, Dr. Emmy and I love you very much. And we'll see you next time here on the show. Bye, everyone. Before I leave you today, beautiful beings, I'm so excited to share a special announcement just with you. On the 20th to the 23rd of April, 2023, I and a fellow guest of the show, the beautiful Ali Paws, will be hosting live in Tulum, Mexico, the Cosmic Heart Tour. If you listen to this podcast week to week and you resonate with my frequency, with my voice, with my love in any of the topics I share with you, then most likely it is time for us to connect and heal in person. So I invite you to join us in Mexico. Join us for some meditations, activations, yoga, cranial sacral therapy, a book release, a live Q&A, poetry, and so much more. These spots are going to fill up super quick because our intention is to make this exclusive and intimate. So please DM me, Cosmic Heart Tour, on any of my social channels. That's Cosmic Heart Tour on any of my social channels, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and we'll book in a meeting so you can join the love. I'm so excited to connect with you in the flesh. Thank you for listening to the Cosmic Love Antenna with me, your host, Harrison. If you gained value or this episode hit your heart, please remember to share this out with a friend, a family member, or a lover. You can also leave your love over on Apple Reviews and Spotify Star Feedback, and this helps me spread my frequency to more souls in need. Finally, if you want to connect with me deeper, want to reach out, interested in coaching, please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn at Harrison Ma, Ma spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Sending you so much love.